Uh, my name's Graham Huon, for those that don't know me, and I'd like to welcome you to the AES Melbourne section meeting and presentation for December 2021. Uh, tonight, we're privileged to have a presentation by Mikhail Barabbas of Lawrence Audio in Melbourne to present on some of the real-world practical aspects of maximum performance ratings for professional sound system loudspeakers and drivers. The presentation is entitled Loudspeaker Power Ratings and Other Myths. With that title, it should be both informative and enlightening. Um, okay, now Mike is going to run through a presentation. And Mike, if you can take a break at the appropriate time, we can catch up on okay. some of the questions. Thank you, Graham. Okay, well, over to Mike. Hello and welcome. And my name is Michael Barabaz, and uh, I currently uh, run a business called Lorance Audio Services. And I'll be talking about my experiences at rating. Uh, <laughs> I was finding power ratings to loudspeakers. Uh, I've designed loudspeakers for most of my life. Uh, I worked at Plessy Ryland before 1975, where I was responsible for generating data sheets, designing loudspeakers, and in, got involved with, um, with three other organisations in Australia that were making uh, Magnavox, CMI, were also making loudspeakers, and we worked on the Australian standards at that time. That culminated in the Australian Standards, 1977, Part 5 loudspeakers. After 1976, I, um, I formed my own business and do speaker design and produce my own product specifications and do my own power testing. So I'll be talking about my experiences. They could be different to other people's, but this is how I've, what I've experienced in assigning uh, power ratings. So firstly, we'll talk about a watt, and a watt is just a measure of power. And in electrical terminology, uh, real watts is, equals voltage by the current by cos theta, where cos theta is the angle between the, the current and the voltage vectors. Um, so when in a DC circuit, it's just VI. Now, this is where we come to an issue. When we talk about watts in loudspeakers, they're not real watts. They're a nominal watt. In other words, AES says a watt is V squared over Z min for um, the 1984 standard, where Z min is what's assigned to the loudspeaker um, as its uh, minimum impedance. And we've got to remember that 746 watts is one horsepower. So that's a lot of power. So what we're going to be talking about is, um, my example is a 12-inch loudspeaker that we actually manufacture. The reason I've selected this particular loudspeaker is the fact that I know a lot about this loudspeaker. It has been both finite element analyzed, the magnet's been FE analyzed. We've done lots of power testing and we've optimized most of the um, the thermal cooling, the cone, everything. So we know a fair bit about it. So that's why I've selected this particular speaker. Uh, its AES rating is 400 watts. That's by the 1984 standard. Um, and its program rating is 800 watts. And its linear cone excursion uh, is nine millimeters and the X damage is peak to peak 34 millimeters. And this, uh, if you want a data sheet, it's on the Lawrence website. Now, if we first thing we should get a feeling for what 800 watts looks like. On the left is a one horsepower motor, 746. It's cast iron, weighs 14 kilos. It would be pretty hard to stop the shaft. It's a pretty much of a beast of a motor. And on the right, we have electric heater, where each one of those elements is dissipating uh, 800 watts. And its duty factor is one. In other words, it's on all the time. And as you can see, with that surface area, it glows red hot. So expect the voice call with similar surface area to glow about that hot if it's exposed to air. Okay, so we're gonna power up this loudspeaker with an amplifier. Um, it'll probably get a thousand watt because there's no 800 watt amplifier. And what's the duty factor for the amplifier? Well, we don't really know. Um, it wouldn't be on all the time. So, it'll, but to cope with high 
demands, it's got a fan, it's a fan force cooling, and it can certainly run a test in um, bridge mode uh, on this particular 12. The scary thing, as I mentioned down the bottom, is the fact that we now have amplifiers that are rated at 14,000 watts, 7,000 watts a channel into two ohm, uh, and these would uh, that would actually drive uh, mm, ten of those drivers mm, of the twelve inch drivers, and it's frightening because it's got a you know a sixty amp maximum rating at the seven thousand watts in the two ohms. Now the problem there is that let's say you use that particular amplifier and you've got seven speakers, but today you only need two, so you bring the same amplifier and connect it up, and there's a fault condition this amplifier would not shut down. So you need to understand that because that means that the protection has to be built into the speaker or the speaker system. So the, this 12 inch speaker, it's got no cooling fan. It's, it's efficiency is 2.3%, which is about typical and weighs 6.8 kilos. And we're gonna feed in 800 watts program, let's see. And here I have the diaphragm um, that, that's inside the loudspeaker. Uh, we have a coil, three inches in diameter. Coil height is 21 millimeters. It's wound with uh, PSV wire, 0.32 millimeter diameter, and it's got an efficiency two point, and a mass of 60 grams. Now, this cone is, I think, about one millimeter thick, 40 thou. Um, it, uh, it's got a, a cloth edge, which is uh, cotton and um, Polycotton, a uh, thermoform, and a spider, which is a no mix material. Um, and we're going to feed 800 watts into that. And you saw before that, that 746 is one horsepower. Now, that amplifier that we saw before, if we actually were to attach a welder or an angle grinder, we could grind with it. If you set it to 120 volts in bridge mode and had 120 volt uh, angle grinder, you could cut steel with it. Now, why are last think of uh, ratings important? This, I've created the picture on the left, so don't be alarmed by the flames coming out. That's not a real situation. My job as an engineer is to make product which is safe and can't harm anybody. And uh, one of my fears is that as we're heading in this direction of very high power, very light speakers, very small, uh, with um, uh, people virtually want no weight, uh, smallest possible size, and just put lots of power into it, and it should be fine. Well, I don't believe that's the right direction to go. Um, because on the right, there was a recall here from the post office for a, a speaker system, a domestic product that uh, caught on fire, um, and it was recalled. We don't want this to happen with our products. So what, what determines the power rating of a loudspeaker? Uh, the temperature rise of the voice call. Um, it's got a limit or thermal limits of the soft parts. And incidentally, that cone and spider and cone surround are the soft parts of the loudspeaker. We call the magnet the hard parts. So uh, the glue has to withstand the temperature. Uh, secondly, it's also... The customer would have a perceptible perceived distortion that he can tolerate. So consequently, there, that could be a limiting factor to the assigned power rating. And the physical diaphragm displacement limit is another factor that controls uh, you know, the user power rating. That is the spider or the voice call impacting on the magnet structure could uh, be a, an issue. And the other one is excessive stress or fatigue. So the, uh, unfortunately, the AES uh, test doesn't actually uh, subject uh, the speaker to a high acoustic load. And therefore, the stress and fatigue are not issues that are going to be, uh, are going to come out of that test. The other uh, thing that determines pay, power rating is the user. Is it going to be a heavy metal user? Is it going to be somebody that abuses the system or is it going to be a professional audio engineer that uh, understands the power rating and is going to 
uh, not clip the amplifier and run with a trace vector between 10 or 20? Or uh, is he going to be a heavy metal guy and runs it in square waves continuously? The other thing is that you've got to look at the uh, occupation, health and safety of the audience. As you, if you're the operator, you should be responsible to the safety of the audience. So you should understand power ratings. So the program material, um, we're talking about guitar or heavy metal, um, those factors have to be factored in. Now, <clears throat> I use uh, the, I can't, unfortunately I can't see my headings with this thing at the top. <laughs> so I'll have to guess what the heading is. I think uh, it says that I use the 1984 standard. And the reason I use the 1984 standard is I started with that particular standard and the 2012, um, yes, it's uh, a, probably a better standard, but I didn't want to mix two standards in my product range. And basically the 2012 standard produces power ratings that are 20% lower than the 1984 version of the standard. Um, because the 1984 uses a minimum impedance uh, for the calculation. And most uh, pro loudspeakers, because they get hot, have a nominal impedance of eight ohms, but a minimum of impedance of about five to six ohms because they do heat up. Now, the other thing you've got to look at is, uh, and what is confusing is the fact that we have multiple standards. There are so many of these standards, the IEC standard, the EIA standard, the EIARS standard. And then you can add to that the Australian standard uh, part five, the US, the Japanese, the Brazilian, the European community. So all of these uh, become more confusing. But I won't be dealing with these because I'll be using the 1984 standard because that's the one that I've had experience. And in that one, the driver is mounted in free air. So it has no acoustic load and its um, diaphragm is in the horizontal plane. So there's no appreciable air loading. The driver will be excited with a band ping noise one decade up from the manufacturer's stated low frequency limit. The noise shall be band pass filtered, told to be corruptive, Butterworth filter, and the peak diaromist voltage ratio shall be two to one or six dB. So the peak voltage will be twice the RMS voltage as measured by a true RMS meter. And the manufacturer will state the upper. And the rated power, the rated AS power of the device will be the power can withstand for two hours without permanent change in acoustic, mechanical, electrical characteristics greater than 10%. Now, in my experience, when I do this test, uh, certainly the BL doesn't change, the mass of the cone doesn't change. Um, the one thing that does change is the suspension stiffness, because in this in the process of excurting it with so much power, some of the bonds in the spider and the surround are broken. Um, and consequently, there's a loss of stiffness. And the stiffness actually uh, drops exponentially and then settles. Uh, there's a, what do we call a break-in part of um, the stiffness change, and then there's a constant part. Um, I haven't found a speaker that doesn't uh, to lose stiffness after exciting uh, power. And generally, um, the resonance would, during the life of uh, a speaker, drop to about 80% of the out-of-box resonance. So to overcome this 10%, and the other thing you've got to remember is that you've got to, if you leave the speaker, some of those bonds recover. And there's a recovery period. If you leave it for 24 hours or more than a day, it'll recover generally to about 95% of the original. But it, during its working, when it's actually working, the resonance actually drops. So we've already discussed that it's RMS voltage by true RMS and divided by Z. So it's a nominal power rating. It's not the real electrical power that's going into the loudspeaker. It's a nominal AES power rating. And the music program has been accepted to be twice the continuous rating or twice the AES rating. And it's higher because the speaker is not 
the AS standard is continuous for two hours. Nobody plays a, a musical instrument continuously flat out for two hours. So because the speaker can handle twice the power, we assign uh, 800 watts music program, which is sounds pretty safe. It's only 3 dB higher than the uh, AES rating. And, and raw music and speech has got a crisp factor of 16 to 20 dB. So consequently, 800 watts sounds um, pretty safe to me, should be. So the next thing we should look at is uh, loudspeaker failure. So if we're going to feed a lot of power into speaker, how, how does it fail? I'm, and I'm not talking about speaker failures on production. This is after, uh, this is a good loudspeaker out in the field. It'll either fail thermally or from mechanical damage or stress. So in the thermal part, the voice score will overheat and there'll be a bond failure. There could be an adhesive failure due to the heat and the soft parts uh, due to excess heat can soften and fail. In the mechanical side, we have the voice call uh, or the spider striking the magnet structure, or we'll have uh, excessive stress in the cone when it's put in an in a acoustic load, which is greater than three air. Uh, then the stress on the cone uh, on the diaphragm would increase. Um, and likewise on the spider and the surround. And lastly, uh, the, it can fail due to fatigue. Fatigue is uh, where we have long-term, especially if the speaker's operated in its breakup mode. In the breakup mode, we have uh, very high stress and a lot of nonlinearities and uh, fatigue will generally occur in the cone breakup if you use it in the breakup mode. Okay, now this one, I dragged this out of the AES standard and, uh, uh, sorry, the Australian standard, 191127 um, part five. And I believe Neville Thiel was involved in um, deriving this curve. I was told that whether it's classic music, um, country, Music has got this spectrum of power. And I said, what about rock and roll? He said, yep, same. He said, the only difference is heavy metal. Heavy metal has got more harmonics out in uh, parts in this area out here. Because if you have a look at this, uh, basically 150 is maximum, um, where the maximum power is. So down here, we don't, in the base range, we don't have a lot of power uh, in the 20, 30 cycles and not much program down there, uh, but we have a lot of cone excursion. So you get mechanical damage in this area down here. You have thermal damage in the area from basically 500 to 300 where the power is three dB down. And in actual fact, the maximum heating occurs around about 200, which is Z min for this particular 12 inch loudspeaker. Up here at these higher frequencies, we generally have stress and fatigue because in this range here, the cone is breaking up. We're going to have high stress in the cone and therefore uh, we're going to have fatigue or that's where fatigue occurs. So now the temperature rise in the voice call is actually exponential, but the AES test is actually a long-term test and it's basically at the end of its test, it, it has the temperature stabilized. In other words, the losses within the loudspeaker equal the heat dissipation out of the loudspeaker. And therefore the temperature rise T is equal to the watts divided by the surface area times a constant, which is emissive, emiss emiss I can't pronounce that word. <laughs> it's watts per square meter or, or um, that radiate out from the surfaces. So one would think that all loudspeakers with similar, you know, at 800 watts and, and 12 inch similar size would have the same temperature rise. Well, that's not, well, not quite true because, you know, um, depending on the material, we're gonna allow, have a higher temperature rise or we can have more surface area in the voice call or we'll look at and I'll discuss how we can reduce the temperature rise in the loudspeaker. 
Now, if we look at thermal real power, the real power um, occurs where the phase is actually zero. You remember the power equals VI cos theta, and cos theta equals zero. So uh, resistive load, and that occurs at Z min, at in this case, 200 Hertz. It also occurs at resonance. But at resonance, the impedance is quite high, so there's no real heating effect, and there's a lot of cone movement. So therefore, we have convention cooling at this point. So not much heat in this area, but you've got to be careful about running at 200 Hertz because uh, uh, that is where the, most of the heat occurs. And if we want to work out what the how much uh, real power is dissipated in this particular speaker, we have an equivalent circuit, and you have R E L E. Um, so if we know what the current is, and we measure that, and times R E is the real power dissipated in the coil, and uh, there could be another uh, that I haven't got here across L E, which is due to uh, eddy currents in the pole piece. Um, then we have a mechanical loss in this RMS here, and this is the radiation uh, air load mass at the rear and front of the cone. But this is 2% of that, so you can neglect the, uh, those bits. So the power dissipated in the voice course, just I squared RE. Um, okay, how do we control the temperature? Well, we have the conduction through the air gap. We have radiation from the magnet structure and we have force convection. The other thing is that uh, the thermal class of the wire and the adhesives uh, are important. So if we want a high power rating, then we use high temperature materials. For instance, a class F material can endure 220C for 100 hours and class H 280 for 100 hours. So if you use class H, you're gonna get a higher thermal power, but you're gonna have a higher temperature rise as well. And we compute the, um, the temperature rise from just the, the formula. If we measure um, the, the resistance of the coil uh, and then we apply this, reverse that and work out the T, the temperature rise, if we know the coefficient and we know it's copper, so we use the ohms per degrees Celsius, and we know what the temperature, we can work, work backwards and work out what the temperature. The caveat here is that if you use this formula, which is what we do use when we uh, are measuring uh, voice call temperature, it assumes that the coil temperature is the same all over its surface. Well, in actual fact, that is, it's, it's not uncommon for the voice call to be a lot hotter in certain sections than others. And that is because the part of the coil that's exposed to air, that is the uh, outer part of the coil, it moves into free air. The, when it goes inwards, it moves into steel and therefore has got more conduction. So generally the top turns of the coil are much hotter than the bottom. And how do we measure it? This is... Uh, the old fashioned way we do we we separate the amplifier from the speaker uh, and we pass a um, a constant current into this voice call and then we using a sixth order one hertz low pass filter we measure and and data log um, the re of the drive unit. Unfortunately, Wolfgang Klippel said, well, that's not very good because you're feeding DC current. And in certain cases, you're displacing the voice call and causing um, uh, DC offset. And uh, he came up and what I use is uh, his uh, Klippel analyzer. So we're gonna talk about the different, what can we do to uh, reduce this temperature ice in this 12 inch loudspeaker? This is just the magnet part of the, the speaker. Uh, the light blue is steel. And this are these are drilled holes in the back plate. We call them rear vents um, or through magnet cooling vents. We have the main rear vent, which uh, most speakers have, just a central hole. 
the idea being this part of the coil would want to get that heat out. But unfortunately, that heat, what comes down here bypasses the, the voice call, which is what we want to. Now, this voice call has to move up and down. It's got a uh, X max 34 millimeters, 17 millimeters each way. It's not allowed to scrape on these steel components and its clearance on the inside is typically 12 to 15 thou. And likewise, uh, a fraction more on the outside. This, this plate here, the top one is either called the front plate or top plate. The black thing is the frame. And if the frame has an airspace underneath, it, generally only in small areas, we call that an under spider vent. So when the spider moves up and down here, when this moves up and down, it pumps air through this air gap and back under the front plate. The idea being that that could cool the front plate and, uh, and dissipate some of the heat away from the front plate. Um, this dust cap pushes through here, but this, if this is too large, it doesn't push much air down the inside of the voice call. And this area here, if you don't put these holes through the back plate, this area in here gets extremely hot. So we have to maximize these. And well, these are what we call, these are um, the uh, force convection that we have. So we have air flowing through the center uh, vent. We have airflow. We'd like to push air down through the inside of the voice call. We'd like to push to get the spider to push air through the outside of the voice call. We would like to push air underneath between the frame and the and and the top plate uh, to cool the top plate. And then this air that we're pushing into this gap, we want to vent through these holes to the atmosphere and on the upstroke suck new cold air back into the magnet. So. It's a bit of a challenge to, um, um, to get all of this right. Now, one would say, well, let's get rid of this hole here because then we're pumping all the air through here and that would be the best that you could do. It is, but it's got a problem. When you close this, then basically uh, we have turbulent flow through here. We get wind noise. And the other problem is that the QM comes up because we have a lot of losses. The problem being that this dust cap moves up and down an inch and the volume changes. So this is a nonlinear compliance. So making this too small increases the distortion. The reason I chose that particular 12 inch because what I did, I didn't feed 400 watts in, which is its AES rating. I fed in 200 watts because I thought, well, it could get hotter if I block some of these things. So basically, as it stands with a 20 mil rear vent and eight four millimeter holes in the back plate uh, and 200 watts AES um, signal fed in, its temperature rise was 139 degrees. Then what happened is I said, well, what happens if I feed in 200 watts at Z min where it's resistive? Well, guess what? The temperature went up an extra 60 degrees. In fact, uh, at 400 watts, it, would, it's, it went up by one degree per watt on a sinusoidal. So if I fed the AES power rating, it would get to 400 degrees. That speaker would be, I think you'd see smoke well before it got very quickly if, if you fed a sine wave in. The reason for that is that there, you've got said min, all the power is real power, and there's no convection cooling because at 200 hertz, there's not much cone movement. So the other thing is I tried under spider venting. By adding venting, well, it did help a little bit. It dropped it by two degrees. Also, then I actually increased the vent size, and basically, it went the temperature rise went up by 8.7 degrees. So, the vent size is quite critical in controlling the temperature rise. The other thing I tried was um, um, the voice call was wound on an aluminium bobbin to um, dissipate the heat into the bobbin. Um, a lot of people don't like that because it actually um, uh, transfers heat up to the glue joint, the triple joint, where the spider cone and um, 
uh, and voice call mate. Uh, but the aluminium voice call does better than uh, what we call the inside outside voice call by, um, um, yeah, but it's uh, not a lot of difference. Um, everybody claims that the inside, so what happens in the inside, the voice call is actually split. So half the coil is wound, I've got one here, half the coil is wound on this inside of the, and half the coil is wound on the other side. So that's inside out. And then you can use a non-conductive bobbin uh, with that arrangement. So what else could we do? Well, the ultimate, well, add more heat sinks. We put aluminium rings up here. So when the coil moves up here, because these top turns are the ones that get hot, they're moving into free air. If we extend the pole piece, and I already have extended in this model, made it equal to the front plate for conduction. Um, but adding a aluminum shorting ring uh, does two things. It, 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 uh, you get conduction cooling. You also get reduced induction distortion and improved stability as well, and improves uh, thermal con conduction. And we're going to add um, these purple uh, aluminum rings. You can put them on the inside the magnet under here. So as the coil moves, it moves into um, areas where there's conduction to the aluminium shorting rings. And that's pretty much uh, as far as we can go on the magnet design. Uh, the other things that you do, but these are uh, minor, is you sandblast the steel components. If you roughen the surface, by sandblasting, you increase the surface area, and it also um, in, in, it introduces turbulence in the airflow, and, tur and these eddies and cross currents uh, are better at absorbing heat from the steel components. Uh, and then blackening the steel components improves radiation, but radiation is a negligible component. And then there's other things like uh, Baymar have a mold cross or for cooling system, so other people have deflectors above the pole piece. So if we look at thermal damage, this is typical of thermal damage. These top turns are, are really uh, quite black and generally they'll strip off and the insulation breaks down and, and uh, usually the top turns fail. If, if you don't have a conduction path to dissipate heat away here, so obviously the front plate's more in this area, and as the core moves up, it gets hotter. Now, the AES measures the average uh, resistance of this. So you wouldn't know that this was getting hot unless you remove the voice core or you use uh, thermal paint to paint that and see how hot this really gets. So that's uh, the thermal. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is mechanical damage. Uh, do we want to take a break here? Can I have a drink of water? I think that's a good idea. We've had uh, one or two questions too. So while you're drinking, one of the questions was from Victor Benshop. Yeah. Everyone about 2.37% uh, efficiency. Is the rest heat? Um, no. No. Um, Uh, Some of it's going out in acoustical power. I must have skipped the slide, sorry. No, it's okay. It was just you're quoting okay. a, um, a percentage efficiency. I'll, I'll go from memory. Um, when I did the AS test and I fed nominal 400 watts into that loudspeaker, 120 watts was dissipated as real heat in the voice call. And 20 more watts was, so 130 watts dissipation was a total dissipation that the clip will analyze them. That's what I mean. Uh, we missed the slide where I set up the clip will analyzer with the crest factor. No, that's okay. It was really looking at. What yeah, sort of so, overall power efficiency. Um, so 
130 watts is real out of 400 watts AES, if you've worked that out as a fraction, is the real power. Um, the 2.3% is what is radiated and compared to the nominal AES rating. In other words, well, we don't really know what we, because the loudspeaker impedance is uh, not resistive and a reactive load, we talk about nominal watts. So the 2.3% is the real, uh, what's radiated into those um, acoustic radiation resistance mm. front and yeah. back of the cone, divided by the nominal power assigned to the loudspeaker uh, times 100%. But the actual real heating power was 130 watts real power where for a 400 watt AES test. And the rest of that's got to go in mechanical losses, heating up the surrounds and the spider. Yeah, 20 watts. Uh, 20 loss. watts is actually due to eddy currents, uh, mechanical losses, windage losses, and yeah. Or, and yeah. Uh, and 100 and 100, 110, 110 was I squared RE, and 20 watts was eddy currents in the pole piece, uh, mechanical losses, uh, all these windage losses, uh, trying to force air through here, which is turbulent, uh, mechanical loss in the spider, mechanical loss in the surround. Yep. Yeah. That's good. Well, you didn't get much of a drink then, did you, Mike? No. See, that's what happened. I re I did all the electrical, uh, sorry, the thermal together, and now uh, something's gone wrong. Okay. That's okay. So in my data sheet, I assign an X peak. So um, this is a front plate. Uh, and X peak is the voice call length minus the front plate divided by two, so the voice call height. So this area, this is an overhung voice call, and that overhung amount is what we call X peak, should be the linear travel. And there's a similar amount below the front plate, which is X peak. And X damage is uh, when this coil could actually strike any part of the magnet down here or if the spider were to strike the frame or the front plate. And that uh, would cause instant damage. And uh, there doesn't have to be uh, any thermal um, voice call. Often when I've seen mechanical damage, the voice calls are in pristine condition, but the coil is completely damaged. Uh, and uh, this is a picture of what happens. Um, it travels down, the voice call can hit here, the bird uh, and damage the voice call mechanically, or this spider here could either touch the front plate here or onto the frame. And that would also cause damage and mechanical noise. Um, so basically to avoid this mechanical damage, when we do a, a, an AES test, we have to set the starting frequency so that this doesn't occur. A lot of people tell me, like, if I assign 800 watts program power to this loudspeaker, that you can't destroy this loudspeaker with an 800 watt amplifier. Absolute rubbish. You can easily destroy the loudspeaker at 800 watts. If you feed 10 hertz into it, uh, and it's a pro sound loudspeaker with a QT of 0.3, the current excursion below resonance uh, rises immensely, as we'll see, and you will get mechanical damage. It has to be high pass to protect it. So this particular 12-inch driver, it, it had a um, nine millimeters of linear travel. So what I've fed in here is five volts, 26 volts, 47 and 69 volts, remembering that the maximum voltage that we're going to feed in at 800 watts is 80 volts. And we've got X damage at 17 peak. 
So we're virtually, if we were to feed in 50 watts, at 50, sorry, 50 hertz, and we were to feed in 69 volts, we would have mechanical damage. We haven't even got to 800 watts yet. And as you can see, this curve is, is rising. The curve, it keeps going up here towards DC. So at 20 hertz, it doesn't take uh, 800 watts. It takes probably 100 watts to damage this speaker. So it has an 800 watt program rating, but we can damage it at 100 watts. So this is because the speaker is unbaffled. It's got no acoustic load, um, and it has has, and therefore, if you put this speaker in a vented enclosure. It's got no acoustic load below resonance, and therefore a, a high-pass filter is mandatory to protect this driver. If you want to, if you want to assign 800 watt program material to it, and this is what happens when you get mechanical damage. I accidentally fed um, um, a low frequency into this coil by accident, and the coil didn't even warm up, but the speaker was damaged in about five seconds. Uh, mechanically, the voice call's not round anymore. There's only 15th hour clearance. This is uh, not round. It starts scraping. It's all over. Didn't take much at all. This is a 12-inch dri driver uh, uh, where all these turns come off um, from mechanical damage. You can see uh, it's all in some people I've seen actually drive this so hard that this whole coil jumps out of the air gap and then strikes the top of the pole piece, even though the pole piece extends um, a quarter of an inch out of, out of the front plate. One would think that there is no drive when the voice coil is out of the gap. That's not true. The coil keeps driving due to its inertia and momentum, even outside of the air gap, to a point where I've seen people put the, the whole diaphragm this coil will sit on top of the on top of the pole piece in air and then fry and, and you get smoke and they go why. The other thing that happens uh, is excessive stress. Excessive stress occurs when you choose the wrong cone profile. Um, these rib cones uh, stress concentration is in this area. So if we have a high acoustic load, and you're pushing on the voice coil, uh, the weak part is this area here. If the spire, if this suspension limits, then we create a high stress at this point. And why does this cone fail? My preference for high stress is not to have these ribs. Why? Because if you take the path length from the voice coil to the surround, it's longer with all of these ribs. And when we make a loudspeaker, we make a cone. In this case, this cone was 40 grams dry, dry before impregnating. If I made a plain cone without ribs, 40 grams, it would be thicker than this one here with all these ribs. So these ribs are there to control breakup, but they reduce the stiffness of the cone. And if you put that in a high acoustic load, you'll get this kind of result. The cone will fail. This, this here was a speaker that I designed after three years in a bandpass box. And it, this is fatigue failure where due to high stress and the high pressure uh, in a bandpass, uh, you get the, the actual cloth uh, splitting, the cone uh, separating here, and fracturing at this high stress joint around the perimeter. Um, we finished up having to use a, uh, a bulletproof material, a Kevlar material uh, in a bandpass to prevent this from occurring. So, okay. Now I'm going to switch to a different speaker. And why did I switch to this particular speaker? Because I just have a end result coil. Uh, I don't have a, uh, a coil for that 12 inch. I did a lot of testing but I did hundreds of tests and I can't find all the files and the bits and pieces. But I, I have for this driver, it's just a, our economical 15 inch base mid speaker. Um, 
uh, multi-purpose speaker. It's got no cooling vents, nothing special. It's uh, an economical 15-inch speaker that goes into uh, bass guitar cabinets uh, for bands and things like that. It's got no aluminum shorting rings. Um, but it's AES power rating. Um, oh yeah, it handles 250 watts and its program is 500 watts. I think it's rather excessive, but the op opposition have one with a similar thing. It's rated as 600 watts. So here we have a problem. Marketing want the highest possible power rating we're going to sign. If it handles this power, they don't want you to rate it at 100 watts or 200 watts. It can handle 250 watts. So in the course of my life, I've had to test to achieve the highest AES power rating to put on a data sheet to make a sale. Does it make me happy? Nope, not at all. This particular driver has this cone excursion here, but it's got a linear travel. It's only got a modest linear travel of 4.2 millimeters, but it, in real life, it actually can travel up to 15 millimeters. Now, okay, I've got to do an AES test. Well, I don't think doing it at 50 hertz where it's doing 15 is a fair test because the speaker's only supposed to be traveling 4.2 millimeters. And this is free air, it's not in a box. So what I do, I go, okay, I think 60 is a good point. It's nowhere near mechanical damage. It's over its uh, linear travel. I'd expect that amount of cone excursion in real use. So we'll do a, an AES test 60 hertz to 600 at 44.7 RMS and the program will be 500 watts and 63 volts will be the maximum. So, oh yeah, here it is. Sorry, uh, I'll put the, the clip all here. So I use the clip all. So you, and the reason this makes life easy because it's a data logger and it's already pre-programmed for all of these uh, power rating tests. They're all there. Uh, all these other power ratings that I said before, you just call them up under there and they appear so that, that you can't make a mistake. So it's a high pass of 12 dB per octave at 60. It's got a crest factor of six. It's got a low pass at 600 12 dB per octave. Uh, it's um, source is internal. We said at the 44.7 volts, which is 250 watts. There's no voltage stepping. We're just going to run it continuously. It's not intermittent. It's continuous for two hours, like the AS says, and we run the test. Now let's see what happens. This, this is what happens to the voice call temperature in this 15 inch loudspeaker. Over here, we have a temperature scale up to 300. And this particular voice call reach 280 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature rise above ambient of 20. That is very hot. And here is what the other gentleman said. I'm feeding in 250 watts. AES, that is nominal watts. That's V over Z, uh, V squared over Z, right? They're nominal, not real watts, just uh, loudspeaker watts as we refer it. 118 of that is dissipated in the voice call and 130 is the total dissipation. So the difference between 120 at that 10 watts is eddy current losses, windage losses, mechanical losses in the speaker. They account for 20%. Um, and that's probably uh, pretty typical. And what happens to RE? Well, it, this little fella started at six ohms and finished up at 12.5 ohms at two hours. It's an eight ohm speaker. And, it, and, and the reason it survives this power rating is that the power actually decreases because the coil gets so hot. And I go, 
is that really good? Because if this temperature of the coil goes up like that, then the impedance has gone up. And if, if this speaker is in a uh, passive crossover and you designed it for a six ohm uh, um, load on the crossover, well, you haven't got a, a, a six ohm load or an eight ohm load at, if you're running it continuously at 250 watts, because it's now become, its impedance will be 13 ohms, more than double. And here, uh, so clip will actually records, uh, you can set whatever every second if you want squillions of data. Uh, its default is eight seconds. So every eight seconds, it measures the voltage, the true voltage, which is this curve, which would be 44.7. It's not a straight line because it's noise and it fluctuates. And then it records the peak voltage and um, the RMS current and the peak current. And over here, if you have a look at it, even though it's compressed to 6 dB, at one stage, the voltage got to 125 volts, which is 1,953 watts, nominal watts. When in actual fact, the maximum we should have fed in, 250 watts should have been 500 watts or 1,000 watts peak. But it actually uh, got 1,953 for this time here. And why does this happen? Because we, we're clipping all the harmonics, but the phase of all the harmonics are all in phase at this particular point. There's another large point here where it's almost 120 volts. Um, the speaker survived. I find it amazing. So this is the data. It tells me that um, when I did the, the, that the speaker is alive. It's fine. Nothing wrong with it. Its voice call temperature rise was 283.9 degrees. The real electrical input power was only 130 watts. And 118 of that was power in, in heater in, in the voice call. And that was the I IRMS. Uh, um, uh, voltage uh, RMS. And these figures, they're different because this, this, these values here are at the very end here. They're not, if you want this, you've got to print that out as a data sheet and then look at it individually every eight seconds. So this peak here and I peak and U peak is when it turned off. And have a look at this figure. This is a thermal power compression factor. It is 6.36 dB. So at the end of the test, the efficiency of the speaker was 2.3 or something percent. It is now 6 dB worse than that due to heat. So, and this is true for all loudspeakers, not just mine. The most are uh, rated a lot higher than my speakers. And just to show you what the condition of the, the voice call is, started off like this, a nice uh, honey color. And you can see it's very uniform in color, which is, means that there's no instability in this coil was, means it was traveling up as much as it was going down. So that's a good design. You can see the, the collar, uh, collar is an overwrap of um, no mix paper to hold the leading wires uh, as they go up the cone. That is that started to char. And I'd say that I didn't test it at 300 watts. It probably would have withstood 300 watts, but it might have caught on fire too. Um, so the AS rating is the maximum that the loudspeaker can withdraw for two hours. It's not a safe rating. It is the maximum that the loudspeaker can handle for two hours. So uh, this other speaker with a two and a half inch voice call, they claim with their mold cross air deflector above the pole piece, same voice call can handle 600 watts. I tell you what, it, its temperature will be like that. So you can't avoid that. It's unavoidable. 
And that's a close-up shot. You can see it hasn't scraped. That's fine. It's integral. Uh, when it's cooled down, it works. So the AES rating is the maximum power the loudspeaker can endure for two hours. But well, on top of that, it can't handle that power at low frequencies without being high pass because this loudspeaker could also mechanically damage at that a fraction of the power. And don't feed in that power at Z min when it's resistive because this coil will burn out. It relies on the convection cooling and all of those things that I've done to raise its temperature. When I worked at Plessy Roller, my power rating I assigned the loudspeaker was at Z min. I said, that's the worst condition. So I would tell, I'd find Z min on the loudspeaker was around 200 Hertz and feed in enough power till I got to this temperature. And I said, that's it, can't handle any more than that. But the AES rating is about, um, well, uh, 400 watts compared to, uh, what is it? I said 400 watts. Well, it would be 400 degrees uh, versus 280. It's about 30% lower, 30, 40% lower at um, thermal if we do it at Z min. So what are the issues performing the AES test? Well, firstly, I don't think many people do it, to be honest. Some of the figures I see uh, are absolutely crazy, ridiculous. Uh, there's, firstly, there's noise. It, when, you, when I'm doing the 18 and I'm feeding 1,000 watts, 4,000 watts in, uh, that's a lot of noise. You need a dedicated test room because it drives everybody crazy. And, and if you want to do fatigue, it should be more than two hours. It should be five days. And during the night, how do you isolate the noise from all the surrounding buildings? They complain even now with my two-hour test. You've got to have the right ambient conditions um, to do it. Um, in the process, so the other thing I found is, um, um, is amplifiers. I found out that most people, um, I don't, people test their short, they test their short circuit. I've designed amplifiers. Yes, you, you, you set them up on the test bench and you short, you know, that's got short circuit. I can short the wires, it's fine. Doesn't fail. What, what I found is that when you actually run this amplifier for two hours continuous and the amplifier is as, nearly as hot as the loudspeaker and then short the wires, I can tell you it's a different story. Generally, they smoke, and not only smoke in the amplifier, but speakers, and a whole lot goes into smoke. How many speakers do we need to test to guarantee the, um, that we've satisfied the condition? Um, I think five days is too long because the Australian standard said to test for five days to, for fatigue and then allow the speaker to um, stabilize for five days to remeasure that its parameters hadn't changed. 10 day turnaround is far too long. I think uh, the test has got to be able to be done in a day. And we only know the average coil temperature. So we don't really know how safe it is unless we pull the speaker apart and have a look at, was it close to catching on fire? Like I, I consider this one is close to catching on fire, but it passed. So what doesn't the AS tell us? It doesn't tell us anything about the distortion level. It doesn't um, really uh, stress. Uh, there's no real acoustic load. There's no fatigue uh, test is not performed. So no acoustic load, no consideration for the end user. Like if it's a heavy metal user or, you know, is, is it gonna be used in an organ? At a low end, um, we're only extremely low frequencies. Uh, so, and what about the end juice? Um, is it going to be put under the stage or up in the ceiling where there's no ventilation? And is it going to be a is it going to be operated by, in, in a professional way, or you're going to allow anybody to use this particular system? There's no safety consideration, in, in my view, and. And this is the worst part, that so we assign uh, 
a program rating twice what the speaker can handle. But when you get feedback, uh, what happens to the poor speaker? It sees the full rated power at 100% duty cycle. It's on flat chat at twice its rated power in feedback. So you better have a good operator to turn it down fairly quickly. Because if you don't, you, you'll probably see smoke. These are situations where if I design something like this, I would derate the power rating. So that 12 inch, for instance, it's AES is 400, its program is 800. If I put that speaker in a bass cabinet for a bass guitarist, for instance, I would rate it at 400 watts. Not because of the thermal thing, but more because of the fact that it, it'll be excursion damaged and it must be high pass. If it's not high pass, I can't guarantee that you can't blow it up. In fact, it's very easy to blow up. If you have the speaker in this kind of small enclosure, like this horn loaded area, you've got the sun beating down the top of this black box, 45 degrees out in the hot day. The temperature in here is gonna be 100 degrees C plus. And then you're gonna feed 1,001 in this 18 and expect it to survive. I don't like its chances really. There's no ventilation in this system. The other one that's really bad is this one here where different stress on different parts of the cone. Here you've got air movement, so that's a mass loading on this edge of the cone, and here you've got compression. This causes a cone to buckle and uh, causes that surround fatigue that I showed you earlier. And the other thing you've got to look at is what the pressure inside um, the box is. And typically in this band parks, so we expect this, uh, this is an 18 inch that I worked on, the cone to be stationary at 100, when I'm feeding 2000 watts in and at 110 hertz, we want the cone to be stationary and all the output to come out the port and the pressure inside the box to be 165 dB and the surround not to fail or the cone not to buckle. And that's, as I said, that's what happens when you don't get it right. And that's what happens when you don't get it right again. The other thing that you've got to be wary of if you're running systems with a passive crossover is what happens if you lose a driver. So there's a very basic circuit. The whoop is just fully connected. Should have an inductor in there, but I left that out. So we're just going to look at this circuit here and this high frequency device fails. You think this should be okay? Well, it's not okay. If you look at the input impedance, it goes down to 0.3 ohms. Why? Because we've got a resonance circuit here with L here, and this L has got 0.3 ohm resistance. So at 1K, we've got 0.3 ohms. Either the amplifier is going to blow or this choke is going to... Uh, so we've lost the high frequency, so the operator is going to turn up the top end of the driver, feed more power into this circuit here, and pretty soon you'll see smoke coming out of this crossover because he wanted to get more drive. A very dangerous situation. So to protect, um, and the, generally this, this kind of protection is works with uh, high frequency drivers. You don't put series resistors in with whoopers because you change the Q and the uh, uh, box alignment. So, but for, to protect the high frequency drivers, we put a lamp in series with the driver. We can put a poly switch in, um, positive temperature coefficient resistor in series with the driver or a metal oxide varista. Even a fuse or a thermal circuit breaker is good practice for the woofer. Some people put back to back zener diodes across the high frequencies to stop spikes and things getting into the blowing up the tweeter. Ferrofluid can be added into the gap to um, improve the thermal coupling between the coil and the front plane. And there are other devices like um, uh, this uh, uh, power device eminence speaker defender is a programmable uh, standalone unit to protect your speaker. But whatever you do, you can't leave a passive crossover open circuit. So these lamps and that have got to be put before the crossover not after the crossover. And 
this is this 12, we're going back to this 12 inch base driver that's 400 watts, 800 watts. You can see that in this vented box, it was tuned to 42 Hertz and the cone is basically stationary. So you can, no distortion there, only distortion there is from nonlinear port, um, the nonlinearities in the port itself or port compression. And the cone is, it's got nine millimeters and it's only seven millimeters. I don't know how, how many watts I fed in here. I think it was pretty close to its rate of power. But below uh, the port frequency, you can see the cone excursion exceeds the 17 millimeter and damages. So it's mandatory that to protect a vented box that it's got to be high pass at the right frequency, according to the manufacturer's specification. So excursion, for excursion, excursion protection. Uh, and if we want to extend the bandwidth, we have to have a dynamic high pass filter. And this high pass filter has to be both signal dependent and its frequency be signal dependent. And if you want to look at all the details on how to do that, Tom Holman's patent, this one here, tells you uh, how to do that. And the other one is how do we protect it from thermal? Well, We've got to detect the current in here in the voice call through a shunt resistor here, and we feed this back. And because we know the current and we know the resistance of the voice call, we can know the dissipation and, and predict the voice call temperature. And there's all this clever DSP circuitry to protect the driver. But again, it needs to work properly and it needs to be reliable especially where people are, in, uh, are involved in large crowds. So talking about standards, and I'm nearly finished. Um, I like this particular standard. It's a Consumer uh, Electronics Association Standard 206 for powered subwoofers. And basically what we do here is we feed in a tone burst, 6.5 cycles, and hand bursts. The reason we feed in a burst is we don't want the voice call to heat up and get thermal compression. We're going to do multiple testing, so we don't want to get thermal compression. So this particular burst has a one third octave bandwidth and the second octave is more than about 60 dB down. So it's good for measuring the distortion. So we keep increasing the fundamental. This is actually for 100 Hertz. If we were to test, the second harmonic has to be 10 dB down. Uh, the third harmonic has to be mm, 15 dB down and the fourth, fifth have to be uh, 20 dB down and everything. Uh, so that's nine. After the ninth harmonic, they have to be 60 minus 20, 40 dB down. So what they've come up is a, um, a perception of distortion. In other words, what they're saying is that uh, we can tolerate more second and third harmonic. We can't tolerate much of the ninth harmonic and above. So based on our perception of distortion, this at least gives an engineer a pretty good idea of, of but it's not actually used by, in, I haven't seen it used in professional products. And my problem is that most people come to me and say, well, I've got a thousand watt amplifier. Give me a speaker that can do a thousand watt. And I go, how much distortion can you tolerate? Mm. Oh, you know, well, what, what they normally do. And we need this kind of, how do you design without these sort of limitations? So my conclusion is that the AES is similar to what we had came up with in the Australian standard. It's the rated input power handling capacity of the loudspeaker. The input power, which the manufacturer assigns to the loudspeaker driver or system on the basis of the result of a noise test as per the specification. We came up with the rated input, which is a different power, so the, in the Australian standard, there was actually three different ratings for the same product. A power rating for where 
if the manufacturer assigns the no comb breakup or acceptable distortion level as agreed by the customer, rated input program, the maximum normal input power which is made for the loudspeaker driver or system with regards to its intended use. In other words, if it's for organ, it's going to be different to if it's going to be used for speech. So yeah, I'm hope that I haven't confused you too much, but it is confusing. I'm, I get confused because in every time I ask, what is my loudspeaker going to be used for? Before I can uh, tell you what I would assign for that loudspeaker. I can certainly do an AES test and do that, but I'm not happy with this kind of coloration on the voice call. I don't consider if somebody operates it at that temperature, that's, that's a safe uh, usage. Um, and I think customer safety uh, and fidelity acceptance need to be considered. So I'm open to questions. Uh, Mike, thanks very much for that. <laughs> there is a lot to take in, but I think for me that's been very good. We did have a couple of questions on the way through. One of those was, uh, what effect does temperature have on the aluminium former of the voice coil? Uh, it's often... <laughs> I've had the occasion where it has actually annealed the aluminium and softened the aluminium and caused it to fail. But that is also true of uh, glass fibre, uh, Kapton. Kapton, uh, they, all these uh, plastic films, yes, they handle 400 degrees C, but there's a softening effect that you get with, um, with all of these materials. There's also a softening of the suspension due to heat. When you apply that amount of heat, even though the spider is a thermosetting resin, the heat from the voice coil will actually soften the, the resin at those sort of temperatures. Um, but it does re recover. Okay. Not good, though. The other question was, what effect do these temperatures have on neodymium magnets? Oh, and then, well, that, well, probably I, I should have brought this up because what alarms me today is most of my inquiries are people want, um, your, your speaker is uh, far too heavy. Like, uh, I want to take it in an aeroplane. Uh, it's got to be small. It's got to be light. Uh, so I can put it on the plane, carry it with one hand and all my other gear. Uh, and I want it to actually be that loud that it flaps my pants and does everything and makes me feel good when I'm playing. And I'm going, really? Like, you want all of that? So there's this demand for uh, something that is small and light. And if it's small and light, I can tell you it gets extremely hot. I don't know of anything that's small and light and handles a lot of heat. It's like a kettle if you fit fill it 10th full, it boils really quick. If you fill it full, it takes a long time to heat up. So everything that is light, but um, it's more a more demand for uh, neo uh, and neo magnets. Um, there are, they come in different grades. Um, the cheapest grade loses its magnet, magnetism at 130 degrees C, which uh, the magnet structure can readily get to. So be careful with the choice of uh, neodymium. The good neodymium magnets um, can withstand about 150 degrees C, uh, but you've got to select the right grade of uh, neo uh, for the driver, depending on the application. And that's not recoverable. So in other words, there's a permanent loss in magnetism. When it cools down, it does not recover. It has to be remagnetized. A ferrite uh, has got a Curie point of, uh, I think, 350. So it's got to get up to 350C to lose magnetism permanently. Um, I think mm, from memory, ferrites uh, suffer from minus 20. There's, there could be, uh, the BH curve changes and depending on the load line, once you get below the knee of the curve, um, it recoils um, to a different point on the BH curve. And for ferrites, I, I, if I can remember rightly, it's low temperature, it's not high temperature. 
Okay, thanks for that. Uh, to the general audience, now's your chance to unmute and ask questions, if we can take them in some order. Are there any questions, please? Um, Michael, at what point does the um, temperature of the wooden box that you put the speaker in um, cause combustion, which could be a problem for safety in um, public buildings? Uh, look, I haven't really looked at that, but I'm concerned at the fact that uh, there is no um, recommended um, temperature rating for the cabinet itself, the plastic box. What concerns me more that what, uh, what ignites the loudspeaker, and I've seen this happen, uh, where uh, the high frequency driver fails and that uh, inductor is glowing red hot inside and it's glued onto a plastic box. And that can readily catch on fire and certainly will catch the, um, um, the, 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 the Dacron fiber inside, the acoustic wadding material is the first thing to catch on fire. Uh, that catches on fire, then it, it gets onto the cone. And if the cone hasn't got retardants and we, you know, um, and again, uh, nobody tells us that we can put a fire retardant into all of this, uh, but it's not mandatory. I find that uh, alarming. As an engineer, I find there's a lot of things that alarm me in, in uh, professional audio. When I looked at this at, at some stage, um, I saw that there was an example in the United States where a, a hot water pipe was running through a wooden floor in contact with the wood. And it took some years, decades in fact, uh, but the wood deteriorated to the point where eventually a fire was started just by hot water through it. So that's 100 degrees C. Uh, if you put a loudspeaker with a glowing red voice coil in a wooden box, which is typical domestic stuff, yeah. it's not going to take long before it catches fire. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I've tried to get pictures of people, but the problem is, Whenever you do get a fire, um, uh, people don't want to uh, um, put their name to it. Um, they try to hide it. Um, so the, it's hard to get real evidence because what happens is, like, I try to I go, take a picture, show me what happened. What did you do? Um, what happened? And they go, oh, you know, it, it was an accident. Well, you know... <laughs> We don't get any information. Uh, that to me isn't good enough. We need to record and we need to record every event where, where. And the thing that concerns me is I've done an installation, for instance, and and uh, the speakers are to be hung either side the stage. And when then the architect comes along and looks at it and goes, um, mm, mm, I don't like that. It's, it's a real bulky, uh, with the subwoofers too big up there. I want it in the ceiling. And I go, that's not a good place to put it because nobody's going to get up in the ceiling to look at it. That's going to be sitting there for 10 years up there. Was anybody ever going to get up in the ceiling to have a look at the condition of the, that particular driver? Maybe the mice have eaten the cone or whatever, you know. Um, but this is common. There's a common, uh, and it's, you know, uh, people look at, like, people come to me and they go, like, your wolf is right 800 watts. I can put an 800 watt amplifier and do what I like. And I go, no, you can't. It's not like that. Uh, we've got another question here. Uh, the question was from Enrique Salazar. Are you there, Enrique? Unmute. Yes, right. I'm here. Uh, oh, good. What is good. the point? What is the point, Mitchell, about beryllium magnets? Uh, where is the point that the beryllium lose his magnetic? It's uh, all magnets have got a Curie point where they will lose magnetism if you heat them and then cool them. The best way, um, uh, if you want, if I want to demagnetize a magnet and they're extremely difficult to pull apart. You know what you do? You put it on a hot plate for about five minutes and all the magnetism is gone and you can pull right. it apart. 
Fine. Yeah, have a look at the, just Google um, uh, demagnetizing <laughs> neo magnets. There's a very good. There's a guy that uh, puts a different amount. He's got a magnetizer with different. Uh, you got to neos are very hard to magnetize. You have got to get about two thousand amps. Um, so you charge a capacitor. It's an impulse magnetizer between two thousand to five thousand volts, and you just discharge it into a uh, coil with no inductance, basically you want air coiled because steel is saturated. You need to get it uh, a flux density of between 2.53 Tesla to magnetize a neo magnet. But to demagnetize it, you just put it on a hot plate mm. and all the magnet disappears. I don't oh, I see. Heat. Thanks for that, Enric, that's good. Other questions? Uh, I've got one here from David Webb. Is, yeah, sure. is David there? David was saying he it yeah, was okay. advisable to run a speaker with an amplifier of twice the rated power of the speaker. Yes. Is that correct or is that the music power? No, the, the, the recommended standard and standard practice in professional audio is to assign an amplifier twice the AES rated power. Right. Uh, that that is the recommended practice. That's what uh, it's an industry standard. You know, it's what Eminence do. It's what I do. It's what uh, RCF do. It's what BNC do. It's what basically everybody. It's an accepted standard because the AES standard is a brutal test. I mean, you would not normally get a coil to this temperature in operation. Generally. If you're running a PA system, your crest factor is, uh, even with compression, is 10 dB. And clean sound, it's 20 dB. That's a hundredth of a thousand watts. It's, it's nothing. Um, so the only time you've got to be really concerned is feedback. when uh, uh, Because at that stage, you can have the full power going in. And generally, it takes out your high-frequency drivers because they have a very... Um, See, your woofer will have uh, about 100 seconds of uh, thermal time constant before um, the heat gets into the voice call, the specific heat. Uh, a, with a tweeter, it can be just seconds. Uh, can, can I comment too? Yeah, sure. Uh, David, the, the problem is essentially clipping. If you start with an asymmetrical signal, which music often is, mm -hmm. uh, when you clip it at high levels, you produce DC in the voice coil, yep. and it's the DC that does the damage. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, when we say twice the AES rating, we're assuming that you're not running it into clipping, or, you know, yep. uh, it might run into clipping every five seconds or 10 seconds would be okay, uh, because the average level is low, uh, or, you know, but then again, it should be compressor limited. Because the other thing I believe happens when you clip is the fact that the voice, you're asking the voice call to, when it is hot, to change direction in zero time. The reason that uh, mechanical damage happens so quickly is that the diaphragm is moving at 40 kilometres an hour, roughly, and it hits a stationary object and the, uh, the acceleration is infinite and so is the force. So... It, it distorts the voice call immediately. It it's, uh, destroys the voice call uh, without any heat. Um, so any high um, acceleration adds high stress. So if you're putting in a sharp square wave, there's a lot of stress, uh, especially, and a square wave's got twice the amplifier rated power. So the voice call's hot and then stress that it's um, a recipe for disaster. So it basically means that you're not going to run the amplifier into clipping. You're not going to get these, um, these, or oh, theoretically you won't be getting those square waves. That's right. Well, now yeah, 40 you use, yeah. And, and sorry to interrupt, but yeah, use yeah. soft uh, limiting. It should be soft limiting. I know I've got a NAD, I think it's 40 watt, you know, domestic amp, feeding leak 600, which is about 40 watts, but they claim that it can put out more power than that if there are the transients. Would that be the, why they're saying that, or is that just a no. marketing nonsense? That's a, <laughs> it's a peak uh, program. Um, it, um, 
Yeah. So, okay, this ampler, this particular speaker, that 12 inch that's 800 watts, is actually 1600 watts peak. Oh, right. right. Yeah. So, uh, and peak to peak, we, it can handle 3200 watt peak to peak programming material. Okay. Same thing. Yes, yeah, of course. Different expression. And uh, for a millisecond. Uh, well, I, 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 there was there was an install where I had to do an install for a school and they had near field monitors and they were going to put in these speakers that had uh, dome tweeters in it uh, and it was a side fill. And they showed me the specs said that the system could handle a thousand watts for one millisecond. And I go, ooh. So if you've got feedback, uh, you can turn it off in one millisecond. <laughs> I don't think so. I said that won't survive with a student operating it uh, and you get feedback. It just will not work. You need something better than that. Any more questions, please? Okay, well, now's your chance to unmute and I'd like you all to join with me in thanking Mike for a very informative and interesting session tonight. So if you can all thank Mike in the usual way. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Um, that's that's great. Right. Right. Christmas, I wish you all, uh, if you participate in, in Christmas celebrations, I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Oh, good Merry on you, Mike. Good on you.